got it. I don't know what happened, but it came on. <laughs> They recognize the name. He's in charge of maintenance well, and the transportation. Yeah, yeah. And Attorney, what you going to do is bring him back to the devil. I'm done. I'll bring him to the devil. Stick a fork in him. He's done. <laughs> you Thank you, Let me sign it. You put my name on the front, Tony. You got to scratch yours out put my name on the front. There you go. I almost turned my name without signing it. I don't want all of that. I got all of that. Oh, I know. I don't think I the chairs. Yeah, those I'm are nice. for the people, not buying one for me. There you yeah. go, man. Yep, yep. <laughs> How do you feel, Mr. Como? Huh? Say, how do you feel, Mr. Como? <laughs> like the bottom of a stove. You know how that is? Unfortunately. G R A T E. You know what that is? You know what the grade is on the stove? Yes, sir. On the old coal and wood burning stove? That was some of the best food there ever was come off the wood stove. <laughs> My uh, stepdad's grandmother cooked on a wood stove until she just. Grandpa had already passed away. And Did it have the little oven up on the stack where they cooked the, bake the biscuits and all? No, no, she would bake them old yeast rolls in, in the big part of it, you know, and she didn't have the upper part of it. Yeah, well, the stove was down here, but this was, it, the oven was made of the same material that the pipe was. Oh, and it okay. would, the pipe would come up and connect in the bottom of the oven and then go on up through the roof and you could bake in that and do your frying and everything down here on, on top of it. Boy, she had it down too. She oh. Just, oh yeah. Just get out the way, boy. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, she may have learned on, out on a fire place in the yard too. She know? may have. <laughs> let me tell, let me tell you I think they got married about the... Live rich. Service communication agency. Last of 1800s or you know 1900 something. 
Pioneers, huh? Oh, yes, sir. In Calcasieu, Barry? Yes, sir. Had an uncle, they had a, they would go out and see in the summer times that it was real nice because you could walk to where the water was. <laughs> they didn't have any water in the house. Yeah. Oh. Grandpa had a hand pump back there, he used, you know, just before they got all that. Sometimes you had to prime it. You yeah. had to get a little water and pour in the top and then, then do it. It would get after. Yeah. My grandfather had a artesian well. Mm. And uh, he had his cattle trough right there. And uh, he would, they would catch catfish and put them in there and beat the moss from around the I hadn't even thought trough. about that. Yeah. yeah. Get some big old catfish, too. Yeah, well, they, some of them about this long. If they got too big, then he'd take them out and put them in the stock pond. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's just like the people with aquariums, they have certain fish that will eat, eat all, all that stuff algae. off the side. Yeah. I think they call those politicians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What you think, George? You think we're going to see from the union? <laughs> I don't know. I just hope we get some changes. Made. Yes, sir. that's a nice way to put it. Some of them yo-yos. I think Russia could have them. We'll send it to them with our with a bow on them. Yeah. Yeah. been trying to get the old logo back on there, the one that y'all like, the, you know, the original one. Mm -hmm. And it, it's getting better. Um, I think... You don't mean this one, huh? The one that was no, before that? Yeah, the, the one y'all yeah. approved. Oh, some more leftover. All right, good. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, buddy. Help you, think you want me to help you fold the cable right. cross? Uh, <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. You don't to the clean. <laughs> Take care, man. All right, thanks for coming. We use this is to replace what we lost when we gave you all stuff at the training. Yes, sir. I don't think we have enough caps, but they gave me a case of the seasoning. Yeah. And there were 12. So they had two cans left, and we needed 14, so I got those two. <laughs> That's why Wayne brought this. Oh, heck yeah. To haul this out. And he stores it in his shed till we have an extra training class. <laughs> oh boy. I hope y'all get some kind of funding. You know what? I hope y'all get some type of funding. Oh, well, Tomo is trying very hard. Yeah, I'm afraid of that. <laughs> you want a Tootsie Pop? Sir? Want a Tootsie Pot? No, I think I had way too many. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to sit until we get started. Yeah. Already five minutes late. Well. <laughs> you need a stool up there? Huh? You need a stool up there? Or? Yeah. No, I you okay? need a chair. Uh, okay. No stool? No. All right. I'll, I'll be able to last through that. Okay. I don't want to burn my fuel right now. Yes, sir.
they had announced door prizes, that'd get people right. over here, wouldn't it? Yep. <laughs> Please pass it on. Mine's not Our training curriculum that we teach about the video now. Uh, 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 right I mean, you know, when I witness those when I witness those three people getting murdered, I mean, oh, the te te technique and the technique that I'm doing. Right now, what you saw now. I guarantee you, in a couple of days, it's going to be different what you remember than what you remember. He gave away money, now you just don't process it. Ready? Get this. George, you ready? Yeah, but I got to get back to the slide show. Click on the Good afternoon, everyone. If you're not back at your seat yet, if you come on back, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome the most knowledgeable person in school transportation, probably in the country, up to the podium, Mr. George Horn. Well, if BS were music, we'd have a brass band. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, 
Those of you who know, my, know Michael Como know I don't look very much like him. And I probably don't have his knowledge, but he was scheduled to come here and update us on things relative to transportation that are coming out of the state, either through the legislature or the Department of Education. And he contacted me to find out when we were supposed to speak. And I told him this time, and he said, uh-oh, I've been summoned to the Education Committee of the Legislature. And I'm sure he'd rather be here eating his good food and enjoying fellowship with you guys instead of in there getting chewed out maybe for something he didn't do. But anyway, uh, I contacted him to find out what topics he wanted us to cover. And uh, I thought maybe he had sent me a presentation, but he sent me a list. You know that old adage, let George do it? <laughs> so George attempted to do it, and I sent it to him to review, and he gave me the go ahead, so let me move forward. By the way, uh, Charles has agreed if I send him the PowerPoints on, on these two topics that I'm gonna, on these two uh, PowerPoints I'm using today that he will post those on the LASTO website and if you care to download any of that information, you're welcome to do so. These are the topics that he asked me to speak on, uh, statutes that were revised in the 2023 legislative session. I'm not sure why we're just now finding out about it, but better late than never. Uh, Cleo Fields, Senator Cleo Fields has uh, filed a bill, bill number 26, in the current regular session, which we'll address, and it has to do with mandatory air conditioning in school buses. Students with disabilities emergency plans is a topic that he asked me to speak on because there is evidence in some local school districts, private uh, charter schools, not private charter schools, but uh, public charter schools with private transporters that are being overlooked or there are controversies going on about carrying out this federally mandated process. And then documentation of school bus driver applicant pre-service training courses. There's the cop. So we want you to pay attention to this because it applies to all public schools, all public school systems that transport children to non-public schools and to all public charter schools. And if you're not aware of this, we have five categories of charter schools in Louisiana, four of which are public. So that means that the majority of all charter schools come under certain regulations. If you have not become familiar with bullet, uh, Bessie Bulletin 126, that is the charter school bulletin, and I would urge any of you who are in any way involved with the public charter schools in your area that you download a copy of that and you keep it side by side with Bulletin 119. So House Bill 169, I had to look up what it was, Act, it became Act 362 of last year's regular session. And I had to download a copy of that to find out what did affect. And here are the three statutes that that bill, which was signed into law, became an act, uh, and it affected uh, Rev revised statute 17180, excuse me, 1781, subsection CC. Then 17158K. Some of you may be familiar with subsection J. We had all the BS that went on about requiring us to load and unload kids on the shoulder of the road. You remember that? And we said, but hey, we have a lot of roads with no shoulders. We can't do that. So finally, it took us two sessions of the legislature, but it, we got that squared away. So now a new section, subsection K, has been added, and I'll show you the contents of that in a moment. And then it amended RS 173996. 3996 lists all the things from which 
pro, uh, public charter schools are exempt in the statutes, but it also lists those to which they are not exempt. And we've been working for a few legislative sessions now to make sure that the things that are important in student transportation safety are not included in the exempt area, that they are not exempt. And this particular one, subsection B79, states that charter schools are included in the requirements of Act 362. So let's take these one at a time. This is what 1781 subsection CC says. Each public school governing authority shall establish a policy that includes the following procedures for carpool and bus lines at any school that includes any of the grades kindergarten through five. And here they are. I'm not gonna take the time to read them now because you can download those. How many of you have already begun to implement policies and procedures to implement this new statute? Okay, good. There may be some hands <laughs> that should have gone up, but maybe you haven't been told. And you're thinking, well, this is something that the schools have to do. They have to have a separate, an area designated for loading and unloading students who are coming to and from school in the carpooling process or, or other vehicles other than school buses. But what might that do to your loading and unloading of students on school buses? Some of you may have campuses where you can't get all the buses that are coming in off the road. What's that going to do with traffic flow around the schools? Now we're getting away from the schools to the transportation department, aren't we? And so you want to keep that in mind. It may even force changes in bell times at schools. And the principal's saying, not in my school. Well, <laughs> it's time maybe transportation be setting the times for opening and closing of schools. So there's that one. Now in RS 17158K. George, can you go back? Yeah. Can you go back to that last? Uh-huh. Right Thank you. Oh, okay. I need to give you more time to photograph, huh? I knew you weren't shooting for me. Okay, uh, 17158K is stating that if a public school or public school district is providing transportation to non-public schools, then those schools must abide by this as well. Got that one? Okay, then we come to charter schools. RS 17, 3996, subsection B, subsection 79. Now this is the part, the B part, that says that they are exempt except for the things listed below. And this happens to be 79, so you see how many things they're not exempt from. And that's the carpool and bus line policies that are referenced in 1781CC. So just be aware of those, and if somehow or other you believe you're involved in it, then I suggest that you download this information and be aware of it and be in compliance with it because Morris Park already knows what this is all about. What did the Louisiana Department of Education do when they learned about this? And what they did was to amend Bessie Bulletin 119. It was interesting that uh, this has been, that this was approved by the state board in February and here it is the middle of March and we're just finding out that it happened. And so I've asked Mr. Como to please communicate more frequently with us, the people that are responsible for transportation in a timely way so that we don't get caught with our britches down. You know, if, if the law passed it and we're not aware of it, still <laughs> ignorance of the law is no excuse for the law. So that means it puts the, the arrow of liability directly on us. So Bessie added in section 903, the section on loading and unloading, they added a new section. 
subsection E under operations, safe car pool loading and unloading of students. And these are the things that you will find in this revised edition of Bulletin 119. The revision was made February 2023. Uh, how many of you are Louisiana Department of Education certified school bus driver instructors and have received the new curriculum? Would you raise your hands, please? Okay. Keep your tape, put your hands down only if you did, you did receive the revised bulletin here. Put your hands down if you received it. Leave your hands up if you didn't receive it. Okay, but you, you don't have the new curriculum yet, George, so you haven't received it. Okay, so good. We got it out to you, and we want to make sure now that when you make copies of Bulletin 119 as your handouts before you begin Unit 1 of the LSBD course, that's the one you want to copy. The only thing it changed was something that may not affect these people, but we want to ensure that our trainees have the most in, up to date information that the state board policies acknowledge. So that's an important thing. Those, what? It was in February 2024. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was February 24. The previous one was February 2023. The most recent, February 24. Thanks for that correction. Now, those of you who are instructors whose certificates have not yet expired and you have not been through retraining, you will receive those bulletins as soon as we can schedule you for retraining. These are just some of my observations and maybe a couple of them I've already mentioned. That if you have not previously been made aware of the statutory requirement passed last legislative session, then you want to download Bessie Bulletin 119 and become familiar with it. And because it's been uh, revised, all supervisors, instructors, school-based administrators in public schools, char public charter schools, and certain non-public schools should be informed of the new requirements. So please, folks, spread the word. Um, I think that Wayne told me that uh, he made, was made aware of this by a non-public school where his grandchild is attending school. That's how he learned about it. And you know, that uh, that's a bad way. We should get it directly from the Department of Education and not in a circuitous way. You know, that reminds me of when we had the school bus, school bus owner operators and instead of going this way to the school, they'd go this way to the school to increase their mileage. And, oh, no, that's the way I gotta go. Okay, physical changes to campuses may be needed in unloading and unloading areas for school buses and other motor vehicles because we don't want them hogging for the same spaces. Drop off and pick up schedules may be affected. Teacher bus duty assignments may be affected and those of you who have union contracts may have to take this into consideration in your negotiations. So just, just you may not know to what extent this is, how it's going to affect everything, but certainly the Human Resources Department of the school system must be notified as well because they're probably the ones who are overseeing the uh, union contracts. School districts are different, so I'm not sure how each of yours works. Okay, then Senator Fields has filed Bill, Senate Bill 26, which I don't see how it can pass, but I've been wrong more than I've been right. And what he's, this is all about is mandatory heating and air conditioning systems required in school buses not later than August of 2025, August 1st, 2025. Now it's not talking about only new buses, it's all school buses. I don't for the life of me know how there will be funds and time available to apply this, or to, to implement this statute. 
But you know, just like they pass seat or tried to pass seatbelt laws for retrofitting and everything, they, they don't want to hear from us <laughs> what the realities are. It's just damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. So you may want to get involved in this. You may want to get your legislators involved. I know some of you come from school districts that you simply couldn't begin to do this, much less complete it because of the financial situations that you have. And I suspect we have present here today some people from parishes that resources are so thin that if you passed a 200 mil ad valorem tax, you could not give all of your school employees a hundred dollar a year raise. And that's the real status of some of the impoverished areas of the state of Louisiana. Yet the state can find money to do in everything else. And I'm sure if they mandate air conditioning, they're going to say, when you ask who's going to pay for it, they're going to say you are. So get ready. Okay, there's the bill and, and you can, uh, those of you who are instructors have been through the training and those of you who, who have, are also bus drivers have been through the training to know how to download these bills. But if you are not aware, you can talk to Wayne or me afterwards and, and we'll show you how it's very easy to go to the legislative website and download bills, laws, etc. Okay, now this, we come to something that, that Mr. Como said, his office and the special ed department of, uh, office of the Department of Education have received a number of complaints. And let me just remind you folks <coughs> that with, when parents of children with disabilities cannot get corrections made to violations of IDEA, and of Title 504 for students with disabilities, their next trip is to the Office of Civil Rights. You don't want the Office of Civil Rights to come in and start overturning stones in your school district because they're not going to be satisfied with stopping just with items that are related to the complaint. They're going to check everything. And they can bring your programs to a halt and they can withdraw federal funds that are going in, streaming into your um, special education department and maybe other areas of your school system. So here's uh, uh, right out of, uh, well, this is, this is my verbiage that I added when Mr. Como asked me, well, what are the regulations about it? Students with disabilities, whether they're enrolled in special education classes, and they're considered to be 504 students, must have appropriate, and I've underlined this, child-specific written emergency response plans and must have appropriate child-specific written emergency training requirements to be shared with all school, school district, or transportation provider employees who are responsible for acting in loco parentis for the respective students and who have received proper training in accordance with the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act and with the Individuals with Disability Education Act confidentiality requirements. If all of our instructors are conducting training properly for Unit 6 of the Louisiana School Bus Driver Course, they are sharing information about these two laws, two federal laws. We've even provided an attorney's video, Peggy Burns, who is an outstanding uh, authority in law, but school law, but also especially in laws affecting students with disabilities. She gave me permission years ago to copy her video that's entitled Confidential Records because she's no longer producing that. And so for each person who goes through our training course, we give them a copy of that to show to their trainees and to use for in-service training with other employees such as bus attendants and veteran drivers who may not have had that training, documenting that so that if SPED says 
well, they can't have that information because it's confidential. We say, no, our drivers and our attendants have been trained. They know their limitations. In fact, the law says that we must share that information. Special Ed doesn't have the big card trump to say, no, we're not going to give it to them. Now, they're not going to give you the whole doggone IEP package, but anything in related services relative to student transportation by law, they must share. I had a situation, I'll give you a quick example here, of where a private company was told that a certain driver had to have CPR training because of one student on the bus. The school was told that the bus driver, there was no attendant on the bus at the behest of the parents, and the IEP committee approved it. I don't know why, but anyway, they did. And the school was made aware of that. And the driver did not receive CPR training. The school didn't ask the transportation company, and the transportation company didn't ask the school whether or not the driver had been training had been properly trained. The student was subject to epileptic seizures. The student was picked up around 5.30, 6 a.m. in January. What is daylight like at that time of year? It's dark, isn't it? Company regulations, dome lights on. One day, according to the camera, around 6 a.m., the child began to experience a seizure. The camera clearly shows that the dome lights were off. Driver, earbuds in place, hoodie overhead, radio turned up. Driver, bouncing to the rhythm of the music. Never do you see his eyes cast to the rearview mirror. But the camera is showing all of a sudden the body of the child begins to flail and he pitched forward unconscious against the rear of the seat in front of him. And then as the bus jolted along, the body fell across. Buttocks on the right side of the bus, head on the seat across. Windpipe because of the weight of the body cut off. Camera continues to click along. Eight minutes until the next bus stop. Two children board the bus. The first one wants to go past this child who's lying across the aisle to reach the rear of the bus because that's where the big boy sat. And so he shakes this child and the child doesn't respond. He can't pick him up. So he turns to the driver and you can see him mouthing something and the driver points, the driver is standing by, the driver's compartment doesn't move back to check on the child. And he tells the child to call 911 and the driver remains there. By the time EMTs get there, the child has lost consciousness already and now he stopped breathing because his windpipe is choked off a fatality settled for six and a half million dollars out of court because the attorneys told that company if you go to court with a jury you'll probably pay more all because some people didn't do their jobs now in this case that mr como is telling me about or one of the cases is special ed is telling transportation you have to have this training in transportation is saying, well, we're not going to do it. And I suggested to Mr. Como, he take an army down there and tell him you're either going to do it <laughs> or you're going to be looking for another job. But I'm not sure that's going to happen. But first of all, we need to have the written plan and then we make sure that people are properly trained and have a copy of what that train, uh, plan may be. Many school districts around the United States have what is called an ITP, 
that is taken from the IEP. And the ITP is an individualized transportation plan. Here's what the training must be in the case of if you have to administer medication, if you should immediately contact uh, the paramedics, the first responders to come out, whatever you should do. If you have to apply CPR, then you have to do that. But whatever the need is to meet different kinds of emergencies, this is what you must do. Oh, let me, I hit the button too hard. The wrong way. Sorry. I, I'm sorry, I'm going, hit it the wrong way again. Here we go. Uh, and, and some of these are words directly from, from Mr. Uh, Como. Plans, training, and evacuation drills must include immediate communication. That is, to whom must you communicate first? Is it first responders first? Is it parent first? It, it all depends on the type of emergencies which should be outlined in that ITP or whatever kind of communication you receive and they must be child specific. What we tend to do is to get all of our special needs drivers together and then we give them some generalized instructions. But according to the law, that's not good enough because every child doesn't have the same needs. Huh? Because the child is autistic, we have 10 autistic children, the manifestations of their autism might be different for every one of them in some way or other. Sometimes we can't have two autistic children anywhere near each other. Sometimes we can have them seated side by side, but their emergencies may be different because sometimes children have multiple disabilities and only the specialists know what that is and how they should be treated. Emergency response plans are subject to change. The condition of these children can change, sometimes from week to week, sometimes from day to day or month to month. So as things change, we have to rewrite the ITPs just as sometimes we have to rewrite the IEPs. Then the training part of it is so important. We need to call as trainers the people who have the medical expertise to properly explain it. It could be physical therapists, occupational therapists, school nurses, special educators, medical doctors, specialists of various types. We don't decide. It should be determined by the specific needs of the children. And then that training must be documented. If litigation occurs, folks, and you can't show the times that you issued the proper ITP and conducted the training, guess what's going to happen? I don't need to tell you, do I? Documentation, I just mentioned. Emergency evacuation drills for students with disabilities may be required more frequently than, as Bulletin 119 says, you must do it minimally each semester. Actually, I believe our preschoolers, those with, even without any kind of disability, need it more often than that. You know, Head Start has preschoolers, and by federal law, those children must, be, must have evacuation drills at least three times a year, and more often as necessary. But what we have to take into account is how adaptable are the children on bus A to the types of evacuation that they need to have? If we have some children in a bus that's transporting people to high school, and these children have been riding special buses in the elementary and middle school, and they have regularly had evacuation drills, they may not need them as often. But what about those kids who are riding a bus for the first time? 
they haven't had as much training. What if their mentality or their physicality is inadequate for them to have co uh, cooperated? What if at the school somebody said, well, these kids are not able to, so we'll put them in the classroom while you do the drill out here? Taboo. Those children may have an emergency one day and not know, know not what's going on. But if you have them on the bus during the evacuation drills and the driver and the attendant are explaining, this is what we would do if we had a true evacuation. This is how you would be. At least they're observing what's going on. What if you have a child who is partially sighted or blind? And a bus catches on fire. And all of a sudden, that child hears all this activity and maybe some screaming and what have you. And children are being evacuated from a bus and that child is sitting there knowing not what's going on. Do you think that child is going to be excited and upset and disturbed? I certainly believe so. But if... That child is being told what is happening during a drill. And this is what you will hear in the event of emergency. Then that child is better prepared. So what we have to do as transporters is to do our jobs. Not to the convenience of school administrators but to the necessity of the children that we're transporting because, as I quoted earlier, we are acting in loco parentis. We are acting in the place of parents. And parents would expect us to give that special care to the students that we're transporting. So no matter how severe the child's disability is, the child might have brittle bone disease, well, you're probably not going to practice doing a body drag or, or body lift with that child to get them off the bus. But you would explain what you would do if that's the case and go through the motions. If you haven't heard of Form T-8 and you've been a school-based administrator, then shame on you. Because for decades and decades, you have been required to sign a Form T-8 signifying that all of the students in your schools, not the ones who rode the bus that morning, have gone through emergency evacuation drills. Realizing that there are some children who don't ride a route bus to and from school every day, but they go on field trips, they go on athletic trips. Those buses can have emergencies too, can't they? Those children are supposed to go through the drills. And what that principal or assistant principal or whoever the designee at the school is saying is, this is an affidavit, affidavit stating that these children have had the drills in accordance of bulletin, Bessie Bulletin 119. And that means that the drills are front door first, second door next, front door, second door, I mean rear door simultaneously. I hope you're not putting the kids through the emergency windows and rooftop hatches, but you certainly need to explain to them how that would happen if so. So that documentation, by the way, must be on file in the school or the transportation office. And those of you who are representing private transporters, you should have in your contracts with the schools how that is to be done, how often the training is to be, who's going to be responsible for ensuring that the training was conducted and where the T-8 forms are stored just as you need to have the same program for the T-7 forms where the schools have to verify that the in-class safety training of students is going on. Now, who's going to provide that training? That's for you transporters and, and school representatives to work out, but enter it into the contract so there's no doubt who is responsible for what. And that was another problem that came up in the litigation of the case that I just referenced a few moments ago. 
This one thought somebody was going to do it, and the other one thought somebody different was going to do it, and it didn't happen at all, and the result was a fatality on board the bus. Now, Wayne has brought copies of some documents here that all of you should be aware of. One is Bulletin 119 Supplement Volume 1 that was adopted in 2019. And it includes uh, the school bus regulation specifications and procedures. In other words, it's mainly about the vehicles. And then Supplement uh, 2, Volume 2, which was later adopted in 2020 by the Department of Education, and it's mainly about procedures. Now, in Volume 2, there are two important sections there for you to look at with respect to transporting children with disabilities. Uh, one is in the body of the supplement, and the other is in an appendix of the supplement. And then you find information there on proper securement of wheelchairs, etc. So there are tons of information in those two supplements. So please, you, you can go to uh, just uh, search for bulletins, bulletin 119 supplements, and you'll find both of those and you can download copies. They're not quite as thick as Wayne's copies, but he puts each page in a sheet protector, so that makes it a lot fatter than it actually is. Okay, yeah, you're welcome to come up here and, and take a look, thumb through them to be familiar. And the last thing that, that Mr. Como asked me to address was pre-service school bus driver trainee documentation form signatures. How many of you are supervisors but not certified instructors? Raise your hands, please. Quite a few, okay. Here we're talking about you primarily. Whenever a pre-service training class has been scheduled and has been conducted in your school district, you or some designee other than the instructor are required to sign a document that indicates that the training was conducted by a certified instructor whose certifi certificate number has to be on that form and that all the units of the LSBD course and all segments of the defensive driving course entitled Coaching a School Bus Driver have been completed by the instructor. The instructor has to turn in a form also, but the instructor doesn't sign the form that is documenting that the instructor actually did it. So you have a responsibility not only to sign the form, but to be sure that you can affirm that everything was done according to Hall. Because those forms have also been subpoenaed in court, case, uh, court cases from Mr. Como. And when he can't take the notice of intent that the instructor has to turn in before a, a class is held, and these two documents plus a list of the sign-in sheets for the training, then the documentation is not complete. And as a result of some of those failures, Mr. Como has been rescinding the certificates of certain instructors, and you might want to check, you supervisors might want to check to see whether or not you have a certified instructor, uh, instructor in-house. Now, this is the form, and I know you can't read it from there, but it shows unit by unit of the LSBD course and segment by segment of the DDC course, when they were taught, how many trainees were in each class, and who taught the class. Now, <clears throat> the same instructor may not have taught all of them. For example, Wayne and I sometimes team teach. You probably have noticed I don't get up and down these steps too well, and I can't stand for seven hours without resting now like I used to be able to. So I might teach unit one, and he teaches unit two and three, and I come back for four and five or something like that. So each of us then has to turn in our form, but we fill out this form with who did what uh, so that Mr. Como has that section. And we see, uh, looks like that bottom part, I put a box around it, but it, it's not highlighted very well, but that's the section 
that somebody must sign to validate that this was done. It doesn't have that, that frame around it uh, when you send it in, but I just wanted to call attention to that. And finally, this is contact information for Mr. Como, in case you don't have it. And that's his title. He's the director of Safe and Healthy Schools. And there, uh, there is his uh, email address and telephone number as well. And he welcomes you to call if you have any, any questions about this. So before we go to part two, are there any questions you want to ask about Mr. Como's information? Pardon? I, I can't hear you. The question is, where is he at? Oh, he's at the Louisiana Department of Education. What did I say at the beginning? He was called to the legislature to testify to the Education Committee of the Louisiana Legislature. And he had no choice but to come. Well, thank you. He brought me a bottle of gin. I wouldn't just say anything, George. Okay. Any other questions? Then let's roll. I was asked to describe and discuss the Louisiana School Bus Driver Instruction Certification Instructor Certification Program. As as some of you know, I was with Jefferson Parish for Jefferson Parish Schools for 32 years, 17 of which I was assistant superintendent and one of my departments was transportation. I was somewhat known as a boat rocker because I was taught at a fairly early age that if the boat ain't rocking it ain't moving and sometimes we had to do things that we thought may not be politically expedient but if it was right for the kids then it was right to be done and so I in those days administrators could gain tenure and at the time this happened I was the only one of five assistant superintendents who had been in a position old enough to be to have tenure and some of the all the rest of them were under contract and when I spoke out they'd say Horn you better shut up you won't get your contract renewed and I said I don't have a contract I have tenure ha 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 and so I would say things sometimes that I shouldn't. And one day, one of those assistant superintendents asked me after I'd had a torrid board meeting, what did the board say to you? And my director of transportation who heard him say that, he said, she said, well, I tell you, a picture speaks clearer than a thousand words. She had drawn a little picture of what had happened that night. And this is what it looked like. <laughs> so that's happened to me a few times. <laughs> and if I turn around, you'll see that it hadn't healed yet. So we keep getting it when we announced about the changes that occurred and the need for recertification of instructors. The stuff hit the fan. A lot of people said, why do we have to go back to there? I've been teaching this course for 20 years and you can't tell me anything I don't know. And you know, I, I don't think it's fair and everything like that. And Mr. Como told us to tell them, well, fair or not, if you want to be an instructor, this is what must happen. The purpose of this training program dates all the way back to a last of the, the a, a genesis of it was a LASCO meeting, yay LASCO, that occurred in, I don't remember if it was Bossier or Caddo Parish, but one of the two. And it was a result of training supervisors who were tired of having inconsistent training information. And one parish did it one way and another did it another way. One was, was buying this stuff, another buying this stuff, and nobody was teaching the Louisiana specific regulations. The former superintendent, I believe it was of Bossier Parish, who became Representative Smith, 
from that district and another state representative were invited to the Lasto conference. And all hell broke loose when the supervisor started venting. Their venting wasn't against the representatives, it was against the Department of Education for lack of leadership. The following legislative session, the legislature passed and the, and the uh, governor signed into law a statute that required the Department of Education to develop a universal curriculum for pre-service training of school bus drivers. <coughs> The state had to provide instructors to teach that curriculum to other instructors. They had to disseminate that training curriculum and make sure that every school district and later on when charter schools came in, into being and private transportation companies came into Louisiana that they were following the same curriculum. And so here's a little bit about that. And the purpose of my presentation is to give you some highlights and to bring you up to date with where we are. If you want to look that law up, it's RS 17491 that requires the training. And there are other statutes here that clearly define who must be in that training. Yesterday we were talking a bit about having other school-based personnel to drive the buses either as substitutes, activity bus drivers, or whatever. Pre-service and in-service training applies to coaches, band directors, principals, assistant principals, anybody else who anytime drives a school bus transporting children. Not only must they go through the rigorous pre-service training, but they must also participate in the biannual or annual in-service training that must be at least four hours a year in addition to all those other things that have been dumped on them, like ethics training and now epilepsy training and so forth. Anybody not know about the, the epilepsy training? Okay, so you're all familiar with that and you're all up to date on that. Even Wayne and I have, have, have our certificates for that training. Okay, so you can look in Bulletin 119, Section 101 to learn more about the pre-service and in-service training. Training and certification, among other requirements, includes both classroom instruction for school bus driver trainees and for school bus, uh, veteran school bus drivers. And there is my statement about the coaches, band directors, et cetera. Mr. Horn. Yeah. So the, uh, the annual refresher training for the drivers, it's eight hours, four in the fall, four in the spring, or two and two? Four annually or eight by it by any if you skip a year I, I know of one school district in the state that that has it every other year my recommendation is you have it every year because things change as we've seen in legislative sessions so it's a total of eight eight or four four, four a year or eight every other year as minimal oh gotcha yeah four year but with everything else that's been piled on, I don't see how a minimum is enough. And you don't, you don't teach every, all the same things every year. In fact, the speakers that we had yesterday and today, if they were speaking to something that you might need in your school system. Mr. Robert over here is a specialist in, as, in child welfare and attendance. You may have your, we used to call them, what? What were the supervisors of child welfare and attendance previously called? Well, they also were also visiting teachers. Visiting teachers, that's right. And before that, truant officers, yeah. So whatever they, whatever you're still calling them, but you might have want them to come in and talk to your drivers about the importance of documenting that behavior or what to do in different situations. You may want to have the school nurse come in and give a refresher on first aid whatever floats your boat, whatever the needs are at the time. But for pre-service, for the people who are just becoming certified instructors, it must be the LSBD course and coaching the school bus driver. Is that clear? And it's spelled out pretty clearly in Bulletin 118. 
Okay, so the Department of Education had to develop this program, and then the first time that we had the training, they rented some space in the, I think it was the Sheraton Hotel in Baton Rouge, and they asked a few of us who were veteran supervisors of transportation or instructors to come in, and they asked me to do passenger management, and they asked Buster Flowers to do pre-trip inspections, and they asked um, someone else to, to do this and someone else to do that, and they put people in these different rooms. And they said, when you finish over here with Horn, then you go over here to this room. And they floated them all around, and once they finished, they said, we're gonna serve lunch, and then we're gonna give you your teaching certificates. And that's how it came to pass. The only problem is that first version had laws from Texas and Minnesota and Lord knows maybe even uh, Argentina in there. And we said, but this is in conflict with Louisiana laws. So we had to revise it. And we had uh, three revisions there as, as stated here. The first one in 2011, then another one six years later. And now it's been another six years. We should have done it more quickly, but things were changing so quickly that we couldn't wait. Now, interestingly, in 2025, the National Congress on School Transportation will convene in Iowa. And by law, because Louisiana is required to comply with NCST regulations for specifications of school buses, we may have to revise again right after that. Uh, the 2020 Congress was canceled because of COVID. Otherwise, we probably would have had those changes already put in the 2023 version. It was not until the, uh, November that we were able to complete the updates in this document because not only did we need to complete it in the instructor's guide, but then we had to update the PowerPoint slides and all the handouts and it was left up to Wayne and me to do that. The reasons for that was that several statutes were revised in 2023. I'm aware of at least seven, all that affected transportation. New and additional important information has become available. Those of you who raised your hands to signify that you, that you had the new curriculum and, and the new training. I've seen that we have added in the special ed section uh, uh, two or three or four slides and some additional information on the use of service animals. You never know when a child may turn up in your school district and now all of a sudden you're having to transport a seeing eye dog or some other assistive animal on your school bus. So you need to be aware, not only of what the basic regulations are, but also the resources that we've listed in there where you can get additional information to assist you for child-specific training, animal-specific training, and school bus driver child-specific training. Observations and personal knowledge by Michael Como, the master instructors. Mr. Como has suggested that Wayne or I, or Wayne and I, visit some of these instructional classes to ensure that there is conformity with the regulations. He has been looking at the documents turned in and comparing what is supposed to be with what has been turned in. He has been looking at the failure of some instructors to turn in the reports. And he is not renewing certain certificates and he is rescinding other certificates. The reason for that is second best will never do when we're transporting the most precious cargo. I won't stand for it. Wayne won't stand for it. Mr. Como is not going to stand for it. And that's why he's asked me to address this. Here are some of the examples of what we mean by improper or inappropriate training practices. 
failure for the LEAs, the local educational authorities, and our private contractors to include a full first aid course as required by the Bessie, by Bessie Bulletin 119 for school bus driver pre-service training. Because Unit 8 in the LSBD course is not intended to be a replacement. The bulletin is very clear that you have to have first aid and the LSBD course and the defensive driving course and local rules and regulations and behind the wheel training. But that's not happening. In fact, one case I was involved in, the company actually took the section that stated that you're required to have it and changed a positive statement to a negative statement. And said that where it said the LSBD course unit eight is not intended to replace a full course, they took the word not out. And I caught that when I was hired as an expert witness. And that was one of the downfalls in that case. Failure of instructors to send to Michael Como the notice of intent to conduct school bus candidate instruction classes. After the classes are scheduled, but before the classes are conducted. Or in a case that things change. All of a sudden you, you cancel a course because the class, because maybe you only have one or two people sign up and you know that you have some additional ones who will be coming on maybe a week later. Or in our case, we were scheduled to go certain nights to another school district and a storm came through and the schools closed up and some of you probably remember that, uh, I believe it was late last year. and. Uh, so we couldn't get there and we figured that people would be better off staying with their families instead of coming out on a stormy night and so i sent a revised intent to conduct classes to mr como the next day telling him what the change dates were because we never know when he has assigned somebody to visit those classes or he himself is going to show up to observe them Failure of instructors to accurately prepare the LDOE certified school bus driver instructor pre-service documentation forms and to send them to Mr. Como within 10 days of conducting pre-service training classes. This is not new, folks. He sent a letter out in March of 2021 telling us instructors exactly how and what he wanted us to do to inform him before and after the training. And when we're not doing it, we're not fulfilling our, drive, our jobs any more than your drivers aren't dropping kids off at the home bus stops instead of whatever they're doing. We're supposed to do it the way we were instructed to do it. There's a reason for that. And it's really to save us instructors to protect the school districts in the event of litigation. I've seen these attorneys at work. You know, there's one case, I was on the witness stand for 42 hours, grilled by 17 different attorneys. And it taught me an important lesson about being prepared and having proper documentation. Because they're looking for any loophole to move the, the arrow of liability from their client to the school board employees, or from the school board employees to the student, or whatever the case may be. And so if, if we don't dot all our I's or cross all of our T's, then that makes us vulnerable. Failure of instructors to ensure that accurate school district charter school student transportation company documentation forms are prepared and sent in. That's what I was talking about in that, that previous section, where someone other than the instructor is required to sign off that it was done properly. Stu substituting in whole or in part of the Smith system or any other unapproved defensive driving course for coaching a school bus driver too, which is the only approved DDC course approved by Bessie for pre-service training. That doesn't mean the Smith system isn't a good program. 
But the Smith system is about general defensive driving. It doesn't get into passenger management in such the way DDC coaching a school bus driver does. But even if it did, the state bulletin says that if the company that is producing the, any other defensive driving course wants to have their program approved, they have to go through certain steps. And they have to include the Louisiana regulations as well as general knowledge instructions. And not one company has attempted to do that since that was approved about six or eight years ago. Which means then that coaching the school bus driver is still the official, the only official DDC for free service training. Mr. Horn. Yes, sir. So for clarification purposes, uh, what you're saying is that we cannot use a school bus safety company or Smith system to supplant coaching the school bus driver. That must be. That's right. You can use it to supplement, but not supplant. All right. So now, you can't replace it. And that is for pre-service training. That's right. Now for Yeah, you can for use that in your in-service service training to your yeah. heart's content. That's right. And this goes back to the statute that says there must be a universal training program in every school district and with every private company that's transporting public school students. That way, if someone moves from one locale to another, they don't have to start from scratch with a completely different program than might have been used somewhere else. And I know some of the insurance companies of school bus fleets in Louisiana have purchased that, that good program. There's no doubt about it. I've uh, reviewed it, but um, it just doesn't include a lot of the regulations and state laws that we have in our training curriculum. And by the way, for those of you who have never had the Louisiana School Bus Driver course, the trainees aren't just taught that the law says, the trainees are given a copy of the law so they can read for themselves. And when a principal may tell them, look, so-and-so is broken down and, and I want you to take so-and-so's load, and you say, well, I'll be overloaded. And they say, well, you've got a 72 passenger bus or 71 passenger bus, whatever it is, and you only have 45 children on there. And you say, but they won't fit in my compartmentalized seating. There's not room for them. Well, you can take them, they only live a short distance away. And you've got the law there that says that in the event that every child isn't seated, the bus driver, the transportation supervisor, the superintendent of schools and individual school board members, and anyone else who has responsibility for transporting children will be held responsible. And that includes principals and assistant principals too, doesn't it? I wonder how many of our school-based administrators are aware of that. But we tell the bus drivers, you don't tell them, no, I can't take them. You say, hey, I can take the ones that you say live close by and then come back and get the others. Or Helen over here, she doesn't have many kids. We can split the load. We can get them there. <laughs> but we can't break the law. And so the people who aren't aware of these laws need to know it. I would love it if, if every one of you supervisors who are not instructors and who have not been through this training would sit through the class just to see how intense the instruction is and how much information these folks are being provided today versus what they were maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Violations of copyright laws by copying or purchasing black market editions of participant, participant handbooks for coaching a school bus driver, both of which infractions are violations of federal law and can, be, can implicate, implicate instructors, transportation supervisors, and other school district officials or company employees who were involved in making those copies. We were provided with a copy of handbook where someone had deliberately taken a black marker. Every page in that book states that it is copyrighted, do not copy. They had marked through that and then made copies. Well, if you go to 
some of these commercial print shops and do your own printing, there's the, usually a statement there that you have to click the button or do something that you understand copyright laws and that you're not violating. Well, your print shop people should not be making copies of copyrighted material. And so that has been used against them. And we heard through the grapevine that the company who has the rights of that handbook may have launched a complaint to the FBI naming names. So the chickens may come home to roost in some school districts in Louisiana. Failure of instructors to administer check and discuss responses to questions in the defensive driving course true-false quiz. That's part of the defensive driving course. Failure of instructors to inspect and ensure that participants are completing their response books before instructors sign the certificates, which must not be removed in the book. You know, we had some people that they were nodding off and not paying attention and, and doing this, you know, behind the table and what have you. So we, they thought we couldn't see that we're texting, not paying attention. When it was time then to finish, Wayne and I checked them. If they were blank, the people's time may have spent, better spent somewhere else because they didn't get approved for that. So it's up to the instructors to ensure that it is done properly because when those training documents are subpoenaed and the documents that the trainer sent in were subpoenaed and the attorneys look and see who the instructor was and that the book wasn't filled out and the certificate was signed Guess what's going to happen during a deposition of the instructor? It's going to be tough. Again, folks, we're trying to protect you. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? No, don't keep the book. No. Leave the, leave the, the uh, certificate in the book. Now, when Wayne and I are teaching, and we don't tell everybody how they have to do it exactly, but we give a separate DDC certificate from the one in the book. And the reason we want it left in the book is number one for a record in the event there is litigation. And you know if you have an accident, there's bound to be litigation. But the other thing is, we tell these trainees, look, your personal vehicle insurance company may give you a discount because this is an official National Safety Council defensive driving course. And the National Safety Council is the most highly regarded vehicle safety system in our uh, company in the United States. And there's that little green cross at the beginning of the DDC course, but it doesn't appear on the certificate. And we have had uh, trainees come back and tell us we had 5% or we had 10% discount. That ain't bad for insurance policies in Louisiana, is it? I'll take it any time. Now, <laughs> when, when I applied through my personal insurance company, and I said I'm a <laughs> DDC instructor, and at one time I was also a Green Cross DDC instructor, and they said, well, instructors don't get the discount you have to take the course to get it. So, for 50 bucks, I took the course and got my discount. It, it, uh, got it back. My wife went too, so we saved more than that. Failure of instructors to prepare and to present to trainees who complete the training either, and here's where you have options, instructors, one separate certificate for each of the two courses, which is what I do, or one certificate that lists both courses. In either case, all dates that each course was taught and the names of each instructor who taught all of the portion of the courses must be listed. We were seeing certificates uh, that were, they put the date that they were issued and they may have been signed by the director of instructor, the, excuse me, director of transportation, but not by the instructors. There was no information on there about who taught the courses. 
There again, we're trying to help you to have a clear audit trail of information that you can provide in the event that records are subpoenaed. And I can tell you, when you get that notice, and I think there are probably some people here who can vouch for this, they're gonna to wanna to know when was this driver first hired? When was the driver trained? What documentation do you have for the training? Who were the trainers? All this kind of stuff. They're gonna ask you everything from soup to nuts because they're gonna to try to find a loop, a, a loop there that they can put their fist through and open it up and tell the jury, ha, ah, see, they're at fault. They're not in compliance. I saw the same thing when I was a superintendent and sat in on some of these expulsion hearings. And the attorneys would talk about these awful employees of the school system why they, they wrote a behavior report. Instead of using the official one, they put all this stuff on a plain sheet of paper. Board, what you need to do is fire the employee and put this young man back in school. Am I right, Robert? <laughs> what they're trying to do, again, is point the finger of guilt away from their, uh, the, the person they're defending and the school system. Failure of certified instructors to report changes of employment or personal contact information so they can be notified of curriculum revisions or other important information. I have tried my best to reach certified instructors to let them know they need to come back to get recertified. Telephone number, no good. Try to send them an email, it comes back. Undeliverable, undeliverable. How else am I going to get in touch with them? Don't have a way. Mr. Como doesn't have a way. So what he's going to do is say, well, they're no longer certified. So if you are the head of the department and this person has left you, or you're one of the private companies and a person has left you, please let Mr. Como know. Now that doesn't mean once they leave you, they're no longer certified. But if you have forwarding information, then we can contact them and ask them. Person says, I'm retired. Well, do you want, still want to do training? They can say yes, they can say no. We're not trying to get rid of them. We're just trying to find out who they are so we can keep them up to date. We have a shortage of instructors. We have a shortage of instructors in the state right now. And we're trying to get more. We had five people Yesterday morning, I, I understand I'm going to get to it, Wayne. We're, we're going to, we're trying to get more people. We had five people to take the entrance exam. We advertised it and five is all we could get. Who, who over here? George, I have a question back to, to the last slide at the beginning. Uh, they're required to present the trainees with a certificate. Who? We. Is we this one or? No. This down, one? Down. Yeah. So what we have run into and I've seen is there are people who get trained at a particular place or places um, where they're currently or we're working. When they go to apply somewhere else, one of the first things we, we ask is, you know, have you been to the course? Do you have certificates proof? They can't get their certificates because they're not giving them by that, that particular employer who's, tra who's training them. So then we have to go back and put them back through training again, which is not a bad thing, but, you know, if they're supposed to be getting their certificates, and then yeah, some parents that should be, like, that they should have, be. But they won't get them. Okay, did everybody hear the question, the comment here that, that some people aren't issuing the certificates? What are issues we have that been are giving to, to the employee? Have to give we have them. been telling, and these more, well, we heard about that, and we've been telling the instructors, you tell your employees, this is not a suggestion, this is a mandate. Now you have two choices. You either follow the mandate or you no longer have certified instructors working for you. Is that what you want? And I don't understand why they're not willing to do that. But the other thing is, then you have to put them through, which is time and loss of <laughs> those employees' talents. And Colonel, did you have a question? I, uh, yes, sir. Mr. George, I thought as a committee, uh, advisory committee, we addressed that. Uh, 
we addressed that uh, two or three years ago where the, uh, the, the district has to provide a certificate to the student. And that student can carry it with them from district to district. Apparently, the Department of Education did not notify all entities about that, and that's why we're trying to, to get it included. But, um, okay. but well, you're right. happening in a number of cases is that the uh, district that does the instructing of the candidates puts the certificate on file in a personnel file, but when a driver leaves that district, they will not release a copy of that district or certification for them or the private carrier. Wait now, the, 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 the person who completes the training receives the certificate and then another one is a personnel file? Okay, well if they're not giving it, if they're not, into the personnel file. if they're not giving it to, once the person completes it, or I know in case of some school districts they're saying, we're not going to give it to them as soon as they uh, complete the class, we're going to wait until they start working for us because we're not going to train them to go work somewhere else. And that's okay. It doesn't say when you have to give it to them, but that you have to give it to them. Now, once they are certified and working for you, I see no reason why they shouldn't have a copy of it. And that's when the people who are not abiding by this, there has to be a consequence to them for not having done it. Rhonda? Okay, so are you saying that... Can, can you get the mic over to Rhonda, please? Okay, George, are you saying that? So I'm under the impression that they take the class, they finish the course, they should be awarded a certificate, regardless if they're staying there, they're driving for you or not. Cool. If they well, have completed that course, because if you go coach another parent, work or somewhere else, I'm gonna ask for that certificate. Well, you may, but you may also be told, okay, for you to get that certificate now, you're gonna have to refund me the cost that, that we had okay. to put out to get you certified because now you're going to go drive for somebody else. Okay, so completing the class is one thing as far as you completed the course and here's your certificate for completing the course. But now if you want them to have some type of funds and you spend money for copies and everything else, it seems like that should be something separate up front or well, something that you can discuss with them. We're not, tell we're not telling you, Rhonda, how to figure out how you want to do it. What we're talking about here is that when one person completes that information, they're entitled to have that certificate. But some employers will not issue it to them under the sun. And they're wrong. And okay. Yeah, and they're yeah, wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying completing the class is, I have completed this class at the end of the class or whatever, I should be awarded a certificate. That's all I'm saying. We're, if, but, if I'm working, I know people hold if, I, if I am asked to come do training, in your school district, I'm gonna follow your regulations as far as that goes. If you want to hold a certificate, I give it to you. If you want me to give it to the trainee, I give it to the trainee. You set the rules, but the rules require that at some point you're gonna to have to issue the certificate. We have, yes, sir. Uh, also, you were talking about earlier about the instructor for 20 years, whatever, and they were stealing the research right now. Yes, because you don't have the current curriculum. Right. Right. Now, how often, most people are automatically re, uh, recertified if they meet the requirements within a three-year period, right? right. And if they don't meet the requirements, then it's up to Mr. Como to follow up. But because there are many changes in this, then he has said we have to have them come in and retraining. And there's another reason for that, too. When we started uh, certifying some time ago, we had no indication of the person's ability to do presentations, to do training. And so Mr. Como witnessed this. You know, he usually visits every time we have a training class, unless he has a conflict in Baton Rouge. He doesn't come for the three days, but he comes in there to observe what's going on. And he has interviewed personally some of the candidates who just stood up there and read the PowerPoints like this, couldn't answer questions and such. 
doesn't have didn't have presentation skills. And he told at that time Kathy Gonzalez was working with us as well. And he said, you all are going to have to have people come in there and demonstrate their ability to teach these classes. And that's why we're limited on how many people we can have at a time now because each one has to do a presentation. And all the people present evaluate the presentations. That's only, that's only part of the score they get. And because now we, we started in 2022, the first two groups that had to do presentations, but they didn't have the new curriculum. In November of 2023, the first group to receive the new curriculum also was required to do presentations. In other words, they met everything. So they got, at that time, they got the new curriculum and they got their certificate. Now we had two groups in 2022 who had to do the demonstrations, but they didn't have the new curriculum. So in uh, February of 2024, we had those two groups, if some of them decided they didn't want to continue training, but we had them come to Baton Rouge. They didn't have to spend three days. They'd already spent their three days. So we went over the new curriculum, we gave them the instructor's guides, and we gave them a flash drive with probably three times as much information as they had before. We have videos on there, we have the PowerPoints on there, we have a, a lot of good things on there for them, so they don't have to do all that research themselves. Of course, everything on there is non-copyrighted material, so they can use it. Yes, sir. How much does the recertification cost? Recertification depends on whether or not they have to take an exam before being certified or not. The examination is uh, $75. The three-day course is $450, uh, excuse me, $350. And we pay for lunch each of those three days for the participants and so forth. The state does not pay for any of, of the cost of that. Okay. Sir? Well, it, well, not just people north. <laughs> it's, oh, well, if we raise the tuition to pay the cost for us to travel and board and, and so forth, but... Well, wait a minute now. What, we'll get to you. To answer you, Wayne and I have been paying us out of our pockets until we start got permission to start charging because the state said they had no funds to pay for it. Now we're either not going to have it at all, which will be a violation of the law, or somehow or other we have to recoup. It is. It is, but it's also unfunded to us. Well, it's benefiting you by having certified instructors, sir. No, Question? That's, that's what I was going to say. I'm piggybacking on what he said, Mr. Jordan. What, what happened is to a lot of supervisors... Up Can you use the line? Okay. For, those of you, for those of you who are employed by a school district or a transportation entity, you should be applying for reimbursement for the cost of your certification. This is not a personal expense to you unless you're retired like me. And you self you self fund all your activities, but it's not. Well, let me tell you to take that issue up with Mr. Como and the Department of Education. We're Wayne and I are following the lead, and I'm I'm just playing the devil's advocate, and I can hear what they said, and I hear what you're saying, uh, and I know we're running out of time. But anyway, I'm going to say this: it seems like a money making business, and that's what the, that's what he's pretty much saying is like why. Or we are paying for all these trains. You want to see the spreadsheets? No, I understand. I understand. <laughs> but and then if the state's saying they are they are behind on, on certified trainers, why the state is not providing classes for these transportation supervisors? Because the state got money for what they want to. That's and I'm right. going to bring this issue before our legislators when I see some of them. Because if we're certified, if you're looking for certified trainers, then and I respect everybody in their prospective position, then. 
Mike Como need to find a way to provide adequate training for the supervisors. Don't disagree at so, all. And that's the way, if we can find money in legislative for stuff that we don't really need or, or you couldn't, then we can find monies to train all these operators up in here. So the, the biggest issue is why not have the, you get with Mike Como and y'all come up with a plan and say, hey, we got a north and we got a south and we got a central and let's have classes. And I know that the state can find funding for it, but they just don't want to. Call your legislators and tell them how All right, now I'm going to turn it right back to you. No, it's not up for Wayne and me to do this. It's up for you guys to get to Mr. Como and come up with a plan because we've already proposed plans and have been told there's no money available. You all are going to have to take the initiative. You can't leave it on, on the two of us. We have done the best we can to get the message to you, and I ran out of personal funds to do it. I wonder how many of you are willing to do pro bono what I've been doing for the past 20 years. Not a single hand went up. So don't tell me what I need to do. You all need to get off your fannies and get to Baton Rouge and do it. I have spent enough time in the legislature to tell you how it can be done. Now, some of you are going to walk out of here and say, they ought to do it. Hell no, we ought to do it. If you're not willing to do it, then don't bitch to me about it. Hey, they're here to support us. That's what the department case is supposed to do. There's no doubt. They are, they are supposed to support us. Like, we support our bus drivers. Like, our principals support their teachers and so on down the line. That's what the department of education is for. Look, y'all. That's right. Look, y'all. Hang on one second. Let me, I understand totally what y'all saying. And I'm going to tell y'all. No, I, hey, look, I, I understand what y'all are saying 100%. Steve can tell you the same thing. We've, we've been on the advisory committee. I can tell you, George, Kathy, when she was here, Wayne, they do this work. They get nothing from the State Department. They have fought. They have fought. They have asked. We have begged. They get nothing. They have been constantly shot down, but they are constantly being told, we want more. We want you to do this. We want you to do that. We want you to do this. These two gentlemen are the wrong people to complain to, to be honest, and blame for this. And I'm not saying you're law, I just want y'all to understand. Coming from, coming from what I've seen in dealing with this for the, I don't know, 15 years, I've been on the advisory committee pretty much. Yeah, they should, the State Department should, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, should be paying for this. They should be paying these two gentlemen or anybody else who wants to be a master trainer to go out and train but they get nothing. They need paper, they have to buy paper. They need pins, they go around here after and collect all, all of this. Did you say we changed two words? No. No. No, there's curriculum changes for math teachers. Yeah. We don't make the math teacher get recertified. Yeah. We're not. Well, this is not the time or the place to resolve your issues. Yeah. Again. The answer, the answer to your question is, is that not all of you are teachers, not all of you are administrators, and there's people out there who are undercutting the system. I'm not, I'm not so, so, that's, that's an administration problem for the Department of Education. We have been this requesting is, some of you to become master instructors. This is not the forum for it. We are, we are not the solution to your problem. The Department of Education is. This is LASTO. We're the Association of School Transportation Officials. We are not the Department of Education. We are not, we are all working in affiliation with the Department of Education, but we are not the Department of Education. We have been requesting people to apply to be master instructors. 
When I send them what they have to do, they say, no, I'm not going to do it. If, if you want to make the rules, become a master instructor and work with Mr. Como. Uh, I guess we won't finish this, so uh, thank you for your attention, and, and one day maybe we'll get to finish the presentation. Thank you, gentlemen, for allowing a time for this. Thank you, George. Hey, y'all, just we're going to break now. Just